Hey ya, and welcome to this breakout session. My name is Alessandro Fal Garcia, Senior Solutions Engineer at the Community and Alliances team at Nginx, and I am here today to go over some of the best practices for getting started with Nginx open source. Now, before I start, a couple of housekeeping notices. One, this session is pretty short, so I'm not going to delve too deep into any of the best practices that I showcase, but you'll see I have my contact details at the end of the session. So please reach out if you want me to give you better explanations or pointers. And two, I am going to be hanging out in the chat during the session. So, you know, please feel free to ask questions there too. Now with that out of the way, let's get to it, shall we? Now, I always like to start my sessions or my presentations with, you know, a little recap about Nginx. Now, you'll probably have heard about Nginx before, which is why you're here, so I'll keep it very short. Nginx was created in 2004 and has quickly gained popularity as the fastest web server within the community. Over the years, its popularity has kept on increasing, and as of today, it's the number one web server in the world. And, you know, there's good reason for it. And Genex is kind of like the Formula One car of web servers and reverse proxies. Its performance is unparalleled, and it's built up from the ground to be as lightweight and trickable as possible. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get started with some best practices when installing Nginx. The first best practice I'm going to cover is using our Nginx official repositories. This will get you the latest Nginx release, as well as packages officially built by us for most major distros, including RHEL, Debian, Ubuntu, SUSE, Alpine, and Amazon Linux. If you, instead of using a repos, install Nginx from, say, the Debian or Ubuntu repos, you know, by doing a simple apt install Nginx without tweaking the repo info beforehand, the version of Nginx you will get will most likely be outdated as well as potentially have different defaults and paths than those you get using a repo. This in turn might lead to some already fixed in our repo and the latest release CVEs being present in your environment as well as the different defaults and paths potentially causing Nginx issues if you try to then follow along our docs or use any of the open source Nginx tools that we have available on GitHub. The second best practice is knowing your key Nginx commands. You probably already know about Nginx-s reload, since you always need to run that command when changing your Nginx config. But did you know about Nginx-t, which will let you know if your Nginx config is valid? Did you know about Nginx-uppercase-t, which will dump your full Nginx config into your CLI? Or did you know about Nginx-uppercase-v, which will print your Nginx build arguments into your CLI. Maybe you did, maybe you did not. But these are all useful commands that will come in handy at one stage or another. The third best practice is to stick to your recommended directory structure. By default, there is a file under Etsy Nginx called nginx.conf that acts as your main Nginx config file and contains sensible global settings and defaults. We recommend to avoid modifying this file unless you know what you're doing. Although, as usual, as a tradition, there are some exceptions to this rule. One such exception being if you want to enable UDP streams. Since by default, the nginx.com file only includes an HTTP block. You will also then find a directory conf.d under Etsy nginx that is the default directory for additional Nginx HTTP config files. By default, you will find here a config file called default.conf that includes a sample configuration with the Nginx default landing page. We recommend you start by tweaking the default.conf file to fit your use case. And then as you keep developing your Nginx environment, maybe add more upstreams, more servers, more location blocks, Display the default.com file into further files as necessary. The fourth and final best practice when 
getting Nginx set up is to use Let's Encrypt and Certbot to secure your Nginx server. Certbot has native Nginx integration, so if you have a domain registered already, there really is no reason not to use it to enable HTTPS in your environment. All right, so these were some of the key best practices when installing Nginx, which means it's time to move on and cover some best practices for tuning Nginx to achieve even better performance. Okay, so what you see here is an amalgam of different Nginx directives that will help you achieve better performance. And at the sense right now, it might not make much sense. So let me cover each directive by itself and why you want to tweak it. And, you know, I did just mention not to touch anything in your nginx.com file. But again, as it happens, some of the directives I'm going to cover happen to be some of the exceptions to that rule. So the first directive you might want to tweak is worker processes. By default, the value of this directive is 1, although depending on where you install Nginx from, for example, if you install it from the Nginx repositories, the value might have already been set to auto. The TLDR of why you'd want to change this value from 1 is that if your CPU has more than one core or hyper threading, you want to make sure that Nginx spawns a worker process in each core to enable multi-threading, essentially. Or um, So you want to make sure the value is equal to the number of cores, or if you want to make things easier for yourself, set it to auto so that Nginx handles that bit of logic by itself. The second directive, which can improve performance is, well, it has two directives working together, worker connections and worker or limit no file. You want to increase worker connections from its default value of 512 to 1024 at minimum, although you can probably increase it even more depending on your hardware environment and your throughput. And then you want to make sure you set the worker or limit no file to at least twice the number of worker connections. The worker limit no file directive basically changes the number of open file descriptors you can have at the same time. If you're using Nginx as a web server, you're going to need one open file descriptor to serve data to your client, as well as an open file descriptor to read the data from the file Nginx is serving. So essentially, you want twice the number of open file descriptors as your worker connections. Or when Nginx is acting as a reverse proxy, you will also need an open file descriptor to serve the data received by the upstream server. So in that case, you'd want three times the number of worker connections to be your worker element no file number. The third directive you can trick to get a better performance is the access log. By default, Nginx writes the access log upon every request you get. As you can imagine, constant writing to the log is not very efficient. So, you know, you can turn it off for extra performance. Although, admittedly, that might not be a good idea depending on your environment and the type of access requests that you will get. In which case, I would suggest you at least use either the buffer or flush optional arguments, if not both, to make sure that Nginx only writes to the access log every so often instead of every single time someone queries Nginx. The fourth directive, keep alive. Keep alive lets you reuse open socket connections to your upstream so instead of having to reopen a new connection anytime you query the given upstream. Do note though that to enable keep alive, you will have to set HTTP to 1.1 and rewrite the connection header to not close any connections by default. The fifth directive is the SSL session cache, which only comes into play if you're using SSL in your environment, which again, it's very easy to set up if you have your own domain, you just use Let's Encrypt and Cerebrot. If you do, then enabling the SSL cache will let you cache handshake results instead of having to do a new handshake upon each new connection, which will improve SSL performance all around. Handshakes are very computational expensive. And if you can avoid doing any number of handshakes, all the better. And the sixth and final directive for improving your Nginx performance is the proxy cache lock. If you're using a proxy cache, turning on this directive will make it so that only one single request is sent to the relevant upstream server when there are multiple misses for the same file. Instead of sending a request for each miss, which has fundamentally an unnecessary number of requests that you'd actually 
doing one descent. So to recap, make sure you spawn one Nginx for worker process for CPU core, increase the worker connections T1024 at a minimum, increase the limit on the maximum number of open files to at least twice the number of worker connections, or thrice if you're using Nginx as a reverse proxy, turn off the access lock for extra performance, or set a buffer, slash time to only write locks at an interval, use keep alive to so keep connections to upstream servers open, cache and share your SSL sessions between all your Nginx processes, and send only one request to the upstream server when there are multiple cache misses for the same file. And now let's move to the third and final section of this session, which I like to call best practices inverted, also known as common Nginx mistakes, We've all made at some stage and how to avoid them. Mistake number one. Error log off, unlike access log off, does not turn off the error log. Instead, it creates an error log named off. To turn off the error log, redirect all its data to slash dev slash new. Although you really should not turn off your error log unless you really know what you're doing. If Nginx does crash, you probably want to know why. Mistake number two. Directive inheritance is not Additive. If I had a header at the topmost HTTP block, it will be inherited by all lower blocks unless I can go ahead and add a different header at one of the lower blocks, say a location block. At which point the new header will override any inherited headers throughout the whole location block and fundamentally override and destroy the initial header you set in the HTTP block. This behavior is pretty standard across all Nginx directives unless otherwise noted. Mistake number three, do not use IP hash as your load balancing algorithm if all your traffic comes from the same setter block. Nginx only uses the first three IP blocks to calculate the IP hash, so you will end up with no load balancing. Instead, use literally any other load balancing algorithm, such as the hash algorithm. Mistake number four, do not turn off proxy buffering. It might speed up the initial response to your client, but if it's a very slow connection and you're serving a very large file, the connection will remain open forever, and over time, a few of these connections will cascade into a connection bottleneck. Mistake number five. Do not enable stub data without properly securing access to it. I've encountered more easily accessible data endpoints into internets than I probably should have, because a lot of people forget to properly secure access to those endpoints. It's very easy to secure them though. Use the basic auth directive or the allowed denied directives, or both for that matter, to add a small but effective authentication layer to your data and make sure that random people can't just randomly query your data and like who knows what they do, let's be safe. Mistake number six, do not proxy pass to an upstream directly. Now, a little bit of a caveat, this is probably okay for testing and dev purposes, but in production environments, you do gain a slew of features if you proxy pass to an upstream group instead. Features such as load balancing, upstream stats, keep alives, passive health checks, and remediation strategies should the upstream go down. And mistake number seven. The final mistake I'm going to cover is to not use the if directive if you can avoid it. If is evil. I could spend the whole session going over the nitty gritty on the wise, but I don't have time, not really. So I'll simply stick to saying that unless you're only including a return or read write directive inside your if block, if will not behave like you think it will, and at best will be quite computationally expensive, while at worst will lead to a sec fault and Nginx randomly crashing. For most use cases, the try files directive or the maps, uh, the maps box will do the trick just fine. It'll achieve whatever it is that you actually want to achieve with if instead. And just, you know, if you want to know more about why if is evil, quick Google search should lead you plenty of results into the bunkers logic that happens behind the scenes if you do decide to use if. So to recap, error log off does not turn off the error log. Directive inheritance is not additive. IP hash does not work for addresses under the same shader block. Proxy buffering off might lead to unexpected saturated connections. 
beware of not properly securing your stat locations. It's better to proxy pass the option groups than directly to an option server and if is evil. And just like that, looks like we are done. Thanks for attending. I hope you found the session useful. I know I most certainly did find the research rate quite useful. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach me via any of the socials on the site here. Hope you have a great Nginx sprint, and bye. <laughs>